Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, progressive news and opinion you don't usually find anywhere else. The show is available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, and at opednews.com slash podcasts, with an S. My guest for this show is Yanir Baryam. He's the director of the New England Complex System Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's the author of Making Things Work, Solving Complex Problems in a Complex World. He's used complexity theory and quantum mechanics theory to predict that the Arab Spring would happen and applies these approaches to social problems, healthcare, education, Wealth, warfare, terrorism, and more. His website is necsi.edu. That's New England Complex System Institute, what it stands for. So the first question is, what is complexity theory? How does it relate to systems theory? And how do you use this approach to deal with social, political issues and the like? That's a, that's a quick thing to answer, you know, just a few words. Um, so... Um, where should I start? So systems theory is kind of a part of the roots of, of complex system science. Um, for me, the, the real core of what complex system science is about is kind of the, the mathematical shift from the assumptions of statistics and calculus to methods that can help us understand um, the uh, the way dependencies uh, arise in a system and their implications for the behavior of the system. Because statistics has an assumption of independence and correlations are really a very poor way of understanding dependencies. Uh, calculus assumes smoothness and so it cannot describe sharp transitions. And together they actually form a self-consistent whole that is the root and really the basis of uh, much of uh, scientific inquiry. They're extremely powerful tools. They've advanced us very far. But at some point, we need to include dependencies. And the existence of new mathematical tools that enable us to treat dependencies is where complex system science uh, takes uh, its, um, its foundation. Now, when you refer to dependencies, you're, you're, you're kind of talking about connections, you're talking about interdependence, you're talking about relationships. Yeah. So and my, I, my understanding of, of systems theory is that it has replaced in modern science the more Newtonian, Cartesian, atomistic, mechanistic model because it uses those connections and dependencies, interrelationships, to explain things that cannot be explained without considering them. Right. I mean, in, in the real world, things depend on each other and, and not in simple ways. You know, if it's a simple way that they depend on each other. So we say, well, here, you know, A depends upon B in this specific way and we're kind of done. But if the dependencies change, um, if the way that the dependencies take place involves lots of different things going on and somehow collective behaviors arising like, you know, mobs or traffic jams or panics and so on. The traditional tools are just not well suited to it. And that would also include like ecosystems or like a, a, a complex organism. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it, it, it turns out that, you know, so, so when you look at the traditional tools, you think that you can just push them a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, but actually it turns out that there is a, a breakdown of those assumptions at a very particular place. Uh, and this breakdown was realized in the context of phase transitions in materials, in physics. So when you boil water, it turns out that you can actually make a very specific prediction. There is a point where the water to vapor line ends at high pressure and temperature. And you can make a prediction for the behavior of the discontinuity and density at that point. It's, it's a power law. I mean, the technical details are not that important, but you make a very specific prediction that the exponent of that power law is a half. So wait, wait, just to be clear, what you're talking about is predicting when 
water is going to turn to steam? Well, I'm not predicting it. I'm just describing it. We know that we can measure that it turns into steam, right? It, it, it's just a transition that you can measure. But you measure the change in density, right? Because when water turns into vapor, it get, becomes lower density. Of course. And you can measure how that depends on the temperature. But you can make a specific prediction of how that dependency works. A prediction meaning you can write down a, a mathematical equation and it tells you how that works. And the, the statement that you get is that it should be a half. The exponent is a half. It's a square root function. Okay? And it turns out that when you do the experiment, you get something like 0.334, which is about a third. Now, you can say a lot of things, but a half and a third are just not the same number. Right. So this caused a lot of problems in physics. And in 1970, uh, Ken Wilson figured out the answer. The answer is that the material is kind of fluctuating at all scales. And these fluctuations, because they happen up to the macro scale, you can't assume that the material is smooth, and you can't, so you cannot assume that there's an average density that's actually the right variable to describe the system. And because you're using the wrong variables, your equations, it's not, the equations are wrong because you're actually using the wrong variables. Put that in plainer English. What happens is that you have to kind of zoom in and see more detail and zoom out and see less detail and use that to figure out what's going on in the system. So and the, the existing get, scientific model doesn't do that? The old statistics and calculus model doesn't do that. Keep going. So you have to use this totally different way of thinking. It's not just you sort of, it's, it's the math that changes, but also it's just the way of thinking that changes. Now, you've said that in today's world, no single person can deal with the problems or the complexity of our modern world. How does that relate to what I've just talked about? Pardon me? Can I, you want me to tell you how that relates to this, what we're talking about? That's my question. So here's the thing. When we look using statistics at the world, we kind of take an average. Okay? And we say, you know, the, the person has the average height of people is this average, or the average wealth of people is this average, or the average income, or whatever. I mean, these are averages. But the world doesn't work just according to averages. There are lots of ch differences in different places about what's going on. Wealth is not homogeneous, and it's changing. And um, uh, it may depend dynamically on what the markets are doing and all kinds of other things. So if we want to describe what's happening in the world, it turns out that there's more stuff to talk about the world. But, and this is the key, if we described all of the detail that's happening in the world, we would never be able to get anywhere. So the trick is actually to figure out what are the things that are actually important. And there aren't, that, there aren't that many of them, but there are still so many of them that one person is not going to be able to figure out everything that's going on. So if one person can't do it, how's it get done? Ah, so you're already kind of going to the punchline up front, but that's okay. The punchline is that we do it together. Okay. Okay, we create it together and we respond to it together. Ding, 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 bottom up. That's right. That's the punchline. The punchline is that it's the collectivity of humanity creates the complexity that we're encountering. And it's also necessary for that collectivity to be able to respond to it when there are challenges. Now, the challenges are, are everywhere precisely because of the fact that we're so connected to each other. So remember, I said that things are connected to each other, and that somehow has something to do with the need for complex system science. And complex system science is able to understand kind of what are the things that are really important. And so we can put all that together and say, the world is connected. Because it's connected, something over here affects something over there. No, we lost him, bumped out. Usually what happens when, when we get that is 
I keep talking and he signs back in. So hopefully that will happen. Uh, so Yanir Baryam, who's the director of the New England Complex System Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is the author of Making Things Work, Solving Complex Problems, takes complexity systems theory and he applies it to real-time issues in the world, the military, to education, to educational testing, to uh, development of foreign nations, to war, to uh, all kinds of things like that. And what he's basically saying, and what he said so far, is things are, have gotten really complex, and one single person can't do it anymore. One leader can't do it anymore. Now, he hasn't talked about it yet, but he's going to talk about hierarchy. Hierarchical systems are the way of the world in modern civilization. But they're not working that well, he says, and we need to do something different. Now, I've had as a guest on my show before the author of the book uh, on holacracy. Holacracy is a non hierarchical management model that over 300 different companies have adopted, including Zappos, which is a billion dollar company owned by Amazon. And there are alternative ways to do things. The challenge is we have a constitution that says this is the way it's done. And it is really hard to change that constitution. And it's even harder for the people who hold the power to be willing to let go of the power. So it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. And uh, we're going to see if we can uh, discuss how this is, is working and how, how to make it go. You, you'll splice right, it. Together. So we're back. Computer, computer glitch recovered from. So I was just saying that the world is connected, which is part of how complexity arises. Because there are lots of different things that affect everything that's going on that we have to care about because we have to care about what's happening nearby, but we also have to care about what's happening far away from us all over the world and in different ways. Um, you know, the classic um, statement that someone can sneeze anywhere and everyone gets sick is today true in a very fundamentally, fundamentally important way. Um, and, um, and as a result, there's a tremendous complexity of what we have to deal with as individuals, organizations, governments, of course, and companies. Um, and the result of that is that it's, there's way too much to think about and to communicate about and to respond to than an individual can deal with. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book, uh, called Bottom Up, The Connection Revolution. And one of the things I concluded is one thing that's really important for people to understand in, in this world is, is to kind of develop a kind of connection consciousness. You really need to be able to have an, at least start paying attention to, to the idea that everything is connected to everybody else and everybody else is connected to everything. Makes sense. And uh, It's true. In your book, I wanted to show it, Making Things Work, you, you say that we've, we've kind of shifted to an information e e economy. Or, was, that, was it the economy? So, I mean, the, the real core of this is in, information is in some sense, not in some sense, but it, very closely related to complexity. Okay. When Shannon constructed information theory. He explained that the amount of information that a communication channel can hold has to do with the number of possibilities, number of possible signals it can send. And, okay. and, and complexity is, is the same thing about real systems. It's the number of possible things that the system will do. And in the world today, the key thing is that there are many possible things that can happen that we have to respond to. And when I interviewed Anne-Marie uh, Slaughter, who was the policy uh, 
director for uh, the Department of State, this is pretty much what she was saying, that diplomacy has changed massively because everything's connected to everything else. Yeah. I mean, you talk to executives and companies. I mean, this is manifest. Um, so Talk more about that. I'm very interested in how this applies to business. Do you do any work in that area? Sure. Yeah. It's actually, it, some of it is described in making things work. Um, the, the key thing is that if you look at what management process is about, you know, prior to 1980, organizations were basically run because, you know, the people at the top told other people what to do. All of the management change methods are basically saying that people can't anymore just tell people what to do. Otherwise, why do you need them? So quality management, re-engineering, performance organizations, all of these ideas about how to change organizations are really about distributing control because a hierarchical organization is fundamentally limited to the ability of the individual at the top to communicate with everybody else in the organization that needs to coordinate with each other. Now, I, I have this theory that hierarchy is really something that became dominant with domestication of animals, land ownership staying in one place, and the development of civilization. And before that, for 99% of the existence of humans and hominids, they lived in a much more non-hierarchical, more bottom-up way of, of relating to each other and to the earth. So... On a small scale, local organizations, they could be anything. I mean, maybe they're hierarchical. There's a, a gang leader or a, um, or a tribe leader that told everybody what to do. It, maybe, or maybe they didn't. Maybe, but, but the main thing is that they didn't have any large-scale collective behaviors. Large-scale collective behaviors. Behaviors, right. The, the, the local tribes didn't, weren't connected to other tribes in other places. So what were some examples of contemporary large-scale collective behaviors? So but give me just a moment. The transition that happened with ancient civilizations, with Rome being kind of the, the, the you know, prototype, if you will, was to create large-scale things, right? It's large-scale, the roads of Rome or the, the armies or the the slaves or the mining operation, all of them were large scale. They're large scale at the scale of civilization today. They were huge. But they could be controlled hierarchically because they were relatively simple. Okay. Okay. So as long as there is um, a sufficient simplification at the largest scale, then one person can tell everybody what to do. And they can have deputies that take over pieces of the picture, right? But at their level, it has to be simple enough for them to receive all the information that requires the decision, you know, and to tell everybody that needs to know what to do. But things got a lot more complicated. What made things more complicated? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, we can say that it got a lot more complicated, a lot more complex, technically, because complicated is a different thing. Okay. Okay. It got a lot more complex. Um, but the reason why is actually subtle and, and somehow has to do with the nature of the structure of the world and how people are fundamentally as biological and biosocial beings. Um, which is, I think, I mean, I, you sent me some notes about your book. It's related to the nature of human beings. Um, so the point is that people don't average, at, even at the collective scale, which means that we, it could be that all of us were kind of the same. And if we were all were kind of the same, then it would make sense that one person at the top could tell everybody what to do. But that's actually not the way it works. 
Okay. Even at the scale of civilization as a whole, it doesn't simplify. And it's not obvious that that would be true. Okay. It could be that all of us would end up being software engineers, writing apps for the app store. And if that were true, and we didn't care about anything else except for, you know, uh, advancing our careers and getting, you know, a car or, or two cars or, or whatever it is, chickens in, in pots or something, then the world would look basically the same wherever you looked. And because it would look the same everywhere you looked, we could have a global CEO or a global president that would tell everybody, you know, hey, we need this kind of thing to happen and it would all make sense. In the Soviet Union, they tried to do that, right? I mean, they tried to have a, one person who was responsible for planning, basically, the economic activity of the country. And you have to ask yourself, well, why couldn't they? I mean, they, they did this not because they were stupid, but because they thought they were smart, right? Because it, it, there, is a, there is a traditional mantra, and people in this country also do it, where if you plan something, you know what you'll get right? Okay. And if you plan it carefully, wh wh why do we need many different people and companies to produce food or to produce, you know, chairs or to produce, if we, if we decide that we need this kind of thing, we should plan how to get it. And in the process of planning how to get it, we will make sure that we get it. And they did this for food, for example, and you walk into a supermarket in the Soviet Union in 1985 or 88 or something like that. And Even then, I, I was there in 93, it was the same. You had a, a hundred different kinds of food, potatoes and a few kinds of meat. And, and Compared to 40,000 in the United States. Exactly. And how come careful planning didn't work? And the answer is because of complexity. Because you can't know how many potatoes, how much rice, how many beans you need. And you can't figure out how to plant it and how to harvest it in a way that will give you reliable outcomes. This is the approach of traditional factories. We now, what you're talking about is the failure of top-down planning and management. Yes. And in this country, this is the way big engineering projects work too. And this is the way they're trying to do the healthcare system today and the education system, right? We know what we want in education. We want kids to be able to add and do other kinds of things and learn to run. Right? So we will set up standardized tests and we'll give everyone the same thing and we'll end up with the things that we want. Or in healthcare, we will have managed care, right? Where people will be able to tell everybody how to, you know, how many days in the hospital you should stay after a certain kind of surgery or which physicians you can see and not see and, and which drugs you can take or not take according to some managed top-down process. So no. the, the old approach, the old approach is if there's something wrong, put someone in charge. Because if you put someone in charge, they'll be responsible and they will figure out how to make it work. And it'll work because they'll plan it, figure it out, execute it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in your book, you say sometimes putting a person in charge can make things worse. It's when things are complex. When things are complex, one person cannot coordinate. And this is the, you know, you see how people think this way. After 9-11, the, 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 the commission, what was the main thing that they came up with was the idea of creating a czar of intelligence. I spoke at the intelligence community a few years later, and I said to them, since when are the czars models of good government? <laughs> so you said... If we stick to hierarchies, we're going to fail. But there are other structures that can work, more network distributed organizations, that a cultural shift is happening, where people are realizing that how much you rely on leaders is actually causing systems to be less successful. So first, talk a little bit about different kinds of hierarchies, because you, 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 a 
couple minutes before we started, you sent me an article that had some illustrations of different kinds of hierarchies. So it, it, in that case, it's not, I mean, there are st- different concepts of hierarchies altogether. What I was what just talking about is you have a simple, a simple hierarchy is a, where you have no lateral communication. So if you have a coworker in your group, you're not allowed to talk to them. You have to talk to the boss, and the boss tells you and your coworker what to do. Okay. And if you want to talk to the guy down the hallway, you have to talk to your boss. He has to talk to his boss. That boss has to talk to the boss of the guy down the hallway, and that guy has to talk to the guy down the hallway. Right? Okay. Um, that's a hierarchy. That's a, a, a simple hierarchy. Now, today, there, and even many years ago, there's lots of lateral connections. So the question is, can you understand what functionally is the nature of hierarchy? And and the answer comes down to a very basic statement. I'll just say it. To the extent that one person is in control of the collective behaviors of an organization, to that extent, the collective behavior of the organization cannot be more complex than that individual. It's a pretty big limitation. And, you know, I mean, years ago, this was okay. The real problem is that the environment became complex. And the trick, and this is Ashby's law, I mean, I'll paraphrase it, um, your organization has to match the complexity of the environment that you live in. So if the environment is complex, the organization has to be complex, and one person is only a certain amount of complexity. So if it's not, and if the organization does not match it, what happens? Failure. I mean, that's the nature of what the point is. The organization fails. But the fact that a hierarchical organization fails doesn't mean it turns out that all organizations fail. So what are the alternatives? Well, that's where what you call bottom-up or distributed control organizations come in. Now, that that term, distributed control organizations, could you get into that a little bit? So the basic idea, you know, you have to think about it from the point of view of, uh, let's give an example, like your brain. There really isn't a particular neuron that's telling all the other neurons what to do. Right? Each, each component, each neuron can be much, much simpler than the whole thing, and the system can still function. Now, to say that is kind of nice to be able to say that that can exist. But if you wanted me to map out for you exactly how to put it together, well, that's the whole point. It's highly complex. And it requires a matching. And this is a fundamental statement. You have to match the structure of that distributed system to the environment. A hierarchy is kind of one size fits all. That makes it easy to do. I can teach you how to make a hierarchy. And if hierarchies work, well, you can make a hierarchy and it'll work no matter what's going on. That reminds me of the story of the guy who loses his keys and he's searching under the street light and they, somebody comes up, can I help you? Where, did you? where were you when you dropped your keys? He goes, oh, I was over there. But then why are you looking under the street light? Because the light's better here. It's easier. That's right. So making distributed organizations is not today where the light is. We don't know how to do it. But we have holacracy. Are you familiar with holacracy? I am. I've heard of it. I've looked a little bit about what they're doing. And the part of the, you know, and and it may work in some cases. It probably does because there are some places where almost anything you try will work. Well, I interviewed the author, the guy who created it. I interviewed the author of the book and uh, it's being used by about 300 companies. That was two years ago when I interviewed him. And it's so... it's a neat concept that intentionally avoids hierarchical management. Look, I, I think that these kinds of experiments are really essential, but I will say something fundamental, which is that distributed organizations are not generic. So any specification that someone tells me 
I just have to say, yeah, I mean, that may be a good thing, but I don't know whether it'll work in particular circumstances because it has to be adapted to the particular conditions of that system. So getting back to the question of alternatives to hierarchies, are there different categorizations of management approaches or coordinating of work or effort that have names and characterizations that fit different patterns? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I mean, just to be clear, this is not new. We've been, we're doing this all the time, right? The brain. We're learning about how to do it. I mean, as I said earlier, all of the management change systems are in one way or another working on distributing control. And so are there examples that you can give? Uh, um, any, ex any of the examples, right? Total quality management, re-engineering the organization, um, the, uh, the, um, the um, you know, knowledge management, all of these things, if you look at sort of the structure, there are some very beautiful things. I mean, what, what do many companies do is very simple. Instead of having someone at the top telling people when to produce something, when, when something goes out the door, they, they build the next one. That's a lateral communication process. It's really that basic. Yeah, you've just we've referred to lateral or horizontal decision making structure, but you also said that there's no formula for such a process. Right, but within a particular context, understanding the nature of how things work in that context enables you to build specific mechanisms for doing things in that space. So what are some of the considerations in terms of building that kind of a approach? Well, one of the key things eventually, and you people figure out them in specific contexts, but one of the key and fundamental issues is in fact that the thinking it through is not enough. And so what we have to do is we have to rely on evolutionary dynamic processes. And I've Absolutely. written about this in the con... What? What is evolutionary dynamic? Evolutionary is like trial oh, wait, and error learning. Wait, we've got to do a little uh, program ID here, so we'll get back to that. So, okay. Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by Op-Ed News, Progressive News and Opinion. That's opednews.com. Uh, you can access the show on Pacifica Radio. Uh, if it's not on your Pacifica Radio show, ask for it. it you can get it at iTunes, at uh, Stitcher, and at opednews.com slash podcast. And my guest today is Yanir Baryam, who's the director of the New England Complex System Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and author of Making Things Work. So evolutionary dynamic what was it you were going to explain i lost it already so the the way we make really complex systems is by evolution right biological systems arose through evolution and we have to incorporate those kinds of dynamics into our social processes in order to discover how systems are in some sense one way this is done is in a market context right the, there's a competition and those who are sort of better at some in some ways are able to succeed more but the economic process is not the most general form of evolutionary dynamic so what is um so the, 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 some form of evolutionary dynamic where there is a process of progressive selection, there's a replication with variation and selection with competition. No, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, ch a chapter in my book, and uh, I interviewed Marina Citrin, who wrote the book Horizontalism, which described the Argentinian Revolution and then also discussed uh, Occupy Wall Street. And she described in an old Mayan proverb that talks about two people, two gods, who were connected together. And they could only walk if they talked to each other and asked questions. 
And the, the idea is walking, asking questions. And it sounds like that's evolutionary dynamics, moving forward, engaging in a dialogue, and figuring things out as you go along. Uh, yes. I mean, there's one thing missing, though. The selection. Selection? Right. You have to, ch you have, to have a variety of things that you try so that you can pick the one that works better. So how does that apply to a business? So you can do that in a business context. People do it in a business context all the time. They try it different Marketing, AB if, advertising. If you think of a company as a monolith, you can't think about it this way. But if you think about a company as having many parts that are trying different things, then you can think about it this way. How about government? Ah, well, government has a greater difficulty because we kind of have the, the, the process of governmental change is slow. And it's very hard to say, okay, I've got another government form over here. Let's try it on for size. So um, we are going to have to solve that problem. Um, we have to solve it by um, by creating new systems that work better. So the, the, the revolution that's going to happen, it's not going to be, you know, a violent revolution where we take over the government and put somebody new in power. Um, because putting somebody new in power is the old system. And electing a different person is not the solution either. Because when you elect someone, you put them in charge. And putting someone in charge, it's too complex. So we're progressively disappointed in, in government. But the bottom line, it's not their fault. It's just that they, it's impossible to figure out what the consequences of what they're doing is. So it, it gives me a, a, a couple of thoughts. One, the way that these kinds of evolutionary dynamic experiments happen where they're more likely to occur and be tested out is at a smaller, more local level. If yes, you, absolutely. If you look at single payer in Canada, it started in one province and it quickly spread. And I think that that's probably the way that these kinds of changes in government are going to happen. I'm pretty involved in the public banking Field. There's, a, there's one in North Dakota, but there are a lot of people all over the country trying to get cities and counties and states to do it too, because it could be the solution that saves them from uh, running out of money, that they're really just handing over to big banks to manage their money. Uh, but that, so there's that. So what's been happening is economically also, there's been progressive aggregation that is eliminating uh, diversity and experimentation. So that's worse. That makes things worse, right? Exactly. And notice that it's eliminating the very strength of economic system. Exactly. Yeah. I, so I, we're, I, we're, we're eliminating, we've been, um, we've been eliminating the core strengths of our own economic system by aggregating things to the point where we have, you know, either monopolies or quasi-monopolies across many different contexts. Why? Why does that happen? Well, because, because scale and monopolization matter for profits. And so the economic system, if you think about it, is actually not self-consistent. So there, you're talking about profits with the, within us for one company, not right. a company, no, no entity that considers the big picture is going to con going to do that well but you know the economic system is designed to motivate people to seek profits so the the part of the challenge of economics is understanding that systems are not always self-consistent they can be self-destructive well economics and capitalism are very inconsistent and the problem is that they they leave out considering 
so many of the factors that are involved and they limit it to very small ones that they can get away with limiting it to. Well, but you're still talking about a conscious and aware and intentional picture. Yes. Uh, but we have to get rid of that. What do you mean? Uh, because we, as an individuals, we, we still have to go back to this. Each of us as an individual cannot figure everything out. But the structure of an influence system. on policy and change the system. I mean, if the economic system for profit said you're only allowed to make profit if you also include consideration of the environment and local workers and local communities and seven generations, which is what Native Americans do, then that's a change in the system. Yeah. There is, by the way, there's a really other reason why we have to go local. So local is important because it gives us the opportunity to create other things that we, multiple things that we try out. But structurally, the system is going in a different direction. Also. And I'd like to give a little bit of background on that, if I might. Sure. So remember, one of the things that we talked about was that if the world was formed out of people that were all the same, then we could maybe put someone in charge. Okay. Okay. But people are different from each other. Not only are people different from each other, groups are different from each other. And that's actually a different statement. Okay. And the world could be in the process of becoming more and more connected, go in the direction of having people becoming more similar. But in fact, it's going in the direction of having groups, individuals, groups, and larger groups becoming more different from each other. And that says that we should have local governance and local decision-making in order to enable the local groups to make different decisions from each other. Makes sense. So it's not just that we need to make local in order to compare. There may be different things are good in different places. Well, I, I think that another aspect of local is that it helps people to connect more and to build community. And community, where does community fit into this? So community, why do we need community, is really because different communities are really going to be different from each other. If everybody was kind of the same, you could talk to anybody in the world and that would be kind of okay. So when I have conversations like this, a, a, a concept that sometimes comes up is story. I mean, every community has its own story. Is story something that plays a role in, in any way in, in your thinking and complexity a theory? Story is, is, I mean, you could talk about a story, you can talk about behavior, you can talk about function, you can talk about all kinds of aspects of what individuals do. You know, what you can look at what a person's goals are. You can look at what their values are. You can look at what their role is in the society. So you can do the same thing at the level of community. So okay. in, in the U.S., there is a very great emphasis on individuals as the, as, the, as the level of organization of the system. Individuals have autonomy and rights and so on, but groups are not as strongly recognized. But the world and the way it's behaving is that it's creating group identities. And the group identities are multi-scale, just like the, the boiling water that I talked with you about that has many levels of organization in it, fluctuations at all scale. The world is kind of the same thing. It has many levels of organization in it. And so from the individual through several levels up to the global, we need to have various levels of decision-making. And we have that in the, in the United States, right? The federal government system, right? We have municipal governments, we have county governments, we have state governments, we have federal governments. But recognizing that the reason that we need local governments is because of differences in decision-making. And those are meaningful in terms of differences in values, 
is something that we struggle with. Um, but the world today is moving in a direction that really doesn't allow us to ignore this. So um, I, I've got a couple more questions for you. Uh, I, I've had conversations with people who have grown up in this top-down culture that we've had. They, they think differently than young people. I think that since people born after 1980 have been marinated in the internet and smartphones, and it's a much more bottom-up culture, and they see the world through a more bottom-up metaphoric set of filters. And I think that the top-down filter includes a lot of authoritarianism in it. And I think that people think that way. Now, you've written and spoken about how people have to change the way they think, the way they see the world. Talk a little bit about how that has to change. Well, it starts from people in their local, you know, how they interact with people around them. The old picture, if you look at any book, is a heroic picture of an individual accomplishing great things. The new picture, if you look at many TV shows and so on, you will see teams. Yes, absolutely. Multiple individuals that work together in order to achieve great things. And even kids, they're assigned to be working in groups where the group gets the grade, even if one kid is a slacker and one is a genius. It's the whole group and they have to work together and that's part of the skill set that they've got to develop. I, I wish people understood it as well as you say it, but much of the time today, it's still each individual is supposed to come somehow gain his individual autonomous skills. And what you're talking about is the beginning of a transition. It, it, to, well, what do you mean by that? Go into that. What's the, what, the beginning of what? The transition to what? To collectivity, to teams at all scales. Where do you see it going? Where does collectivity go if it really evolves dynamically in some positive ways for the future of humanity and civilization? So complexity is a very difficult thing to deal with if you have to deal with an environment that's more complex than you are. But com complexity is a good thing if it's on your side. If you and your friends and their friends are working together, then your collective complexity, if you're doing a good job at it, will enable you to solve incredibly difficult problems. And the complexity of the environment doesn't have to be a little bit more than an individual. So say in 1980s, the complexity of the environment began to be more complex than an individual, and that's why we started to have the transformation of business and, and, and society in the way that we're having now. Okay. By now, the complexity of the environment is higher, much higher. And so it's much more obvious that as individuals, we suffer from going it alone. What and are some of the parameters of the complexity that have increased from 1980 until now? I'm sorry? What are some of the parameters of the complexity that have become increasingly complex from 1980 until now? Again, it's the global interdependence. It's the way many things, anything that you do is influenced and in the success of anything that you do, whether it's where you live or what job you choose or who you choose to interact with, how well that will suit you depends upon lots of things that are going on in the world. So it's the connectivity. Yeah, it's still the connectivity. Okay. Give us some so, hope. What is some hope that comes from your work? So, so my work is basically positive. It says that the fact that the world is becoming more complex is a statement of success. It's the success of our working together, creating these dependencies uh, between us. The problem is that in the transition, as we become more complex, during the tr transition, we can't deal with things. The complexity is a driver of the difficulties that then creates the solutions that enable us to deal with the problems. So when I first wrote about it, I was less 
sensitive to the fact that we would have global crises like the financial crisis and the food crisis and the Arab Spring and the Ebola epidemic and so on, because I was so pleased with the fact that we're becoming complex and coordinated and we're going to be able to solve all kinds of complex problems because we can do that. So this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, opednews.com slash podcasts, and iTunes. Uh, my guest for the show is Yanir Baryam. He's the director of the New England Complex System Institute and the author of Making Things Work, Solving Complex Problems in a Complex World. And we're talking about why complexity theory gives us hope. And the answer is because we are getting becoming interdependent, because we are working together, we are going to be able to solve all these complex problems. It's the change is disconcerting. We have to learn new ways of doing things, how to interact with each other in this very positive and constructive fashion. But the science says that we are very likely to be successful. It doesn't guarantee it, of course. Now, I, I get into arguments with some people who, who uh, would suggest that uh, top-down is really good. It's really important. Uh, government is top-down. And so uh, progressives, because uh, my, my site is progressive, so progressives should support top-down. And bottom-up is... Uh, is where you, you see greed and where you see uh, capitalism. Uh, where, where, where do you see that fits in with this top down and bottom up and in terms of uh, complexity and, and where we need to go? So we used to believe in, in an ideological battle. The ideological battle was between the U.S. free market, um, you know, individual rights, and the Soviet Union, which was uh, controlled communist, but in favor of the collective good, right? Collective good versus individual good. Um, what we're talking about here is, is a third option. It's neither of those. It's about a complex collective of diverse individuals collaborating to achieve collective benefit. It's just a different thing. And I think communism and capitalism, they're both pure concepts that don't really exist either. They're, 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 they're fake, really. They, they're well, they're, they're caricatures, surely. Yes. That's a good they one. may be caricatures, but, but they are things. And, you know, without understanding the reason for different systems, my answer would be, you know, either of them might be okay, for certain solutions to certain problems. And in fact, maybe they will continue to exist in part of the world. But what the world is doing, and I can say this in a pretty strong way, is becoming a complex organism, like a biological organism. And the biological organism that we're becoming is more complex than we as individuals are. You talk about human civilization be being a kind of an organism. It's, I mean, the nature of the dependencies that exist across the world are so strong and so complex and so, so diverse, if you want to think about it that way, that we can tell that poking in one place affects things in another place. That's kind of obvious. But that's really the trait of an organism. It's not even the trait of a simple organism. I mean, if you do that to a plant, you can cut off a limb and the rest of the plant doesn't care. But if you do that to an animal, the animal cares. And so human civilization is, is more like an animal than like a plant. And that's saying a lot about the nature of what human civilization is. When I, wanted, when I started thinking about these issues, and this is almost 30 years ago, this was actually what I wanted to think about try to understand what is human civilization? How can we think about it as a system? Is it like, you know, grass or is it like a frog or is it, what, I mean, what kind of thing is it? And, and the 
answer that shows up after you do the analysis, if you will, is that human civilization is kind of kind of an animal, but it's an animal that is more complex than a human being at its scale. So we think of human beings as kind of being the most complex thing around. But human civilization at its scale, so if you were to look at the world, just like you look at me in the face, so to speak, what you would see is an organism that is more complex than you were. That's pretty astounding. The biggest living single entity organism is a mold that covers acres somewhere? Well, my answer is we are that organism. Are. It's, so, it's us. So how, have, how has civilization evolved dynamically from its early beginnings to where we are now? So the, the process that we observe is a process of progressive development of dependencies and larger scale behaviors, but also development of more and more complex parts, more and more complex interactions. It's not, so there's big stuff that happens. It's like, you know, a slime mold or algae or whatever develops and it sets up this large scale thing. Okay? but it's not complex at the large scale. Whereas human civilization is complex at the large scale. We're doing stuff at the scale of human civilization. We've got one minute left. Anything you want to wrap up with? Um, you know, thinking about these issues, the big picture of what's going on on Earth is a lot of, is a lot of fun. The challenge that we face is a challenge is from the individual all the way up to global. Each of us has to find a place. And it's very disconcerting today because of complexity. But understanding that this is a positive thing that we're engaged in, maybe it'll help people overcome the local challenge. All right. The Rob Call Bottom Up Show. I've been speaking with Yanair Baryam, the director of New England Complex System Institute. His website is NECSI. Check out me at robcall.com or iTunes Pacifica. Thank you.